Hello and welcome to Behind the Scenes. Uh, I'm your host, Sean Malone, Creative Director for the Foundation for Economic Education and creator of Out of Frame, a YouTube series where we explore the intersection of art, culture, and big ideas. Here in studio today with Paul Nelson, uh, Out of Frame Shorts Editor and Fee's Social Media Head, and of course, Jennifer Mafasanti, who I believe is coming from her house in Utah, at, who is the Communications Director for the Libertas Institute, which look, Jen, I got it. I said it right. There you go. I'm so proud of you. I'll, I'll forget next week yep. and I'll say it wrong again later. But, you know, here we are. I'm doing my best. Today on the show, we're going to be talking about um, a movie that I really, really liked. It, it actually, I guess, technically came out in 2020, maybe the very t- uh, tail end of, of 2020. And I talked about it a little bit on the show yeah. before. And then I kind of made these guys watch it. Um but uh, it's called Love and Monsters, and um, I mean, I guess it's just streaming. I mean, I don't know if it's streaming anywhere in particular, but I mean, you can it's yeah, just VOD. VOD and you can you can buy it, um, and it's just I just loved it. I, I love the movie. Um, I rewatched it a couple times since, and um, I I wanted them to see it. I want to talk about it. So we're going to talk about Love and Monsters today, like we've been doing the last couple weeks um, when we get into the end of the show. Um, normally we would, or historically, I guess I should say, we, we've been doing bonus sections for our patrons and subscribe to our supporters where we talk about another movie. But I think, again, we're going to continue our current trend of doing Q&A, mostly taken from Discord, from our Instagram, and of course, from Patreon and subscribe star. If you are a fan of Out of Frame or if you're a fan of this, this podcast, this video series, um, Behind the Scenes, uh, feel free to join us on on Patreon and consider supporting the show. Um, Patreon.com slash Out of Frame Show or Subscribestar.com slash Out of Frame Show. We would really appreciate your support. And of course, you'd get access to bonus content we're going to do here, access to a special channel on our Discord. Um, you know, you get early releases of the podcast, a whole bunch of stuff, plus, um, you know, just more access to us, which if you are interested in that, we'd love to talk to you and, and be more in communication. For everybody else, though, we're gonna we're gonna get into this discussion. But before we do, um, I wanted to say I've actually been watching another show right now on HBO Max called The Max. The Max, which Paul has said before, he believes is the the greatest of the streaming apps. Hands down. Made for Love. Have you heard of or seen anything about this? Made for Love. Made for Love. I, I have not. Yeah. So this is a. Kristen Milati show starring her and uh, Billy Magnuson and uh, with Ray Romano as well, actually. It's a strange mix, but um, the basically the premise of the show is sort of Elon Musk type billionaire, tech billionaire type guy. Um, basically meets a woman in and in one day decides that he's going to marry her, takes her to this like weird compound thing that he has where he set up like a, a holodeck, essentially. It can be anywhere in the world and it kind of looks like anything and it's constant paradise where they are. And somehow she manages to be married to this guy for about 10 years while he develops a, a chip that goes in your brain which then will allow, essentially will allow them to monitor your feelings and thoughts and and actually experience your thoughts. Oh, fun. And so the made for love part of this is that he has this idea that he is going to market this to couples where both chips, where chips will be in both brains and will be connected so that the couple can can experience each other's direct thoughts all the time. And I love Jen's face on this. Because oh I agree, it would be horrifying. It's a terrible, terrible, terrible idea. It's a nightmare. So the show basically opens with Christina Milati emerging from a like a sort of a sewer pipe or like a like a manhole uh, where she has managed to escape. Um, it's very strange, I will say. That she's escaped through a dolphin tunnel. It's the only thing I can really, really describe. The guy's been keeping dolphins, multiple dolphins, in tanks on underground, I think, where because uh, he's experimenting with the chips on the dolphins. And she, uh, a little bit of a spoiler, as she escapes, there's a dolphin that kind of gives her 
indication that she can go out this this tube and get out this this way through this sort of manhole cover thing. So she emerges all wet and in like a like a um, you know um, fancy fancy dress like a club you know sequined sort of dress or whatever and she's all soaking wet and she has to run away from this guy so there's only a couple episodes so far um i think three maybe four and um well i don't know what where we're at in terms of the release schedule of the podcast but um maybe there's maybe like five or six episodes now but um it's really weird and and kind of interesting and it kind of gets into this idea of like you know what what you would do, like if you had to be forced into, you were kind of locked into quote unquote paradise. Like it, it everything she, the, her living experience seems to be like the best kind of environment because she can live anywhere. Appear it has the appearance of living anywhere, but everything is fake, and she is kind of trapped in this situation. And then when her husband Billy Billy Magnuson's character. Uh, announces that he's going to do this chip. This is the first time she's heard of it. So she did not realize that he had already implanted this in her and all this kind of stuff. And anyway, it's, it's Christina Malati. It's Ray Romano. It's super funny in a lot of ways, but it's also like kind of gross and terrifying and, and weird. And, and uh, I don't know, I've been kind of digging it, but to your, it, it's the kind of thing that like, I feel like is an interesting swing for HBO max. It's a weird tone. But kind of works for me. I've been yeah. kind of enjoying it. But uh, yeah, I, kind of, I don't know. Kind of, kind of recommend that. I was going to talk about this uh, last week, but I, I didn't. Uh, others, we were kind of engaged in other Rankings. random, super random conversation <laughs> that kind of opened the show. But um, anyway, are you guys, uh, you guys finding anything interesting lately? So yeah, yeah go for it, Jen. Uh, I was also. You know, having having been married for almost 10 years now, uh, knowing everything that my husband is thinking <laughs> sounds terrible. Yeah. Like, yeah, I, I love him. Like, he's amazing. We have an outstanding relationship. And I, I don't need to know what's going on in his head. No. Cars. It's, cars. I'm, It'd be a lot of cars. It'd be a lot of car stuff a lot of the time. It'd be a lot of cars. Yeah, that's true. Um, but there are always things that you think that don't need to be said or heard. Yeah. There's just always things. 100%. Like that. And that's okay. Oh, man. Yeah, well, anyway, uh, I also <laughs> started watching a show on HBO Max um, called The Nevers. Um, oh, I, I've seen promos for that. Are you Are you enjoying that? I am. All and right. As of this recording, there's only one episode out. Uh, we're on a, a weekly release here. And uh, more weekly releases on everything. At this point, <laughs> it's, so. it's delightfully steampunk. Okay. And there's like some serious mystery going on. And I don't really know what's like, we're still very much in the establishing the premise stage yeah. of this show but it seems real fun and just right up my alley and it's well cast it's well acted i i'm really digging it right now so awesome we'll I, see. I i've seen a handful of promos for it and it's something that i was i i felt like i was interested in and it's certainly something that i thought that you would be interested in um it kind of i, I was hoping anyway that it falls into the sort of carnival row territory a little bit but i don't i don't know if that's if it's going to go that direction i'd also like there's a lot of shows like that right now that uh you know like carnival row like there should be a second season or a, another season somewhere for that that's happening that um i have no idea when i don't know there are a lot of things like that at the moment where it's just like coming soon on netflix you know more lock and key or whatever and i'm like when never sometime, sometime soon Two years from now, who knows? It's a mystery. Yeah, The Witcher, another season of The Witcher, probably sometime. They whenever. did. They did wrap shooting on that though. I so, so I've now heard. It's just post production. So I've heard, but uh, Netflix won't give you a uh, won't give you a definitive answer on when when that's all going to get wrapped. But um, nope. 
But I don't know. Is uh, I'm I'm looking forward to the Nevers. Then I'm glad that you've you've had a chance to check it out. I will uh, check it out. Paul, what were you going to say? Or you said that you're, you were. So I'm going to curveball. More sports? No sports. No sports. No sports. Uh, so this is now you got me on a tangent. Speaking of the speaking of sports, um, I I love sports, as as you guys know. Yes, we've heard. <laughs> but since this whole pandemic, when they stop and most. Sports league stopped. I just, I haven't gone back. That's interesting. It's weird. I just, I, I watched football. Mm-hmm. That's it. And I've actually watched more NASCAR than I ever had because they never really stopped. So that was the only thing on last summer. So I just kept on watching NASCAR. Nice. And it's weird. I haven't watched an NBA basketball game years now. Really? And I used to have season tickets. Dang. But it's, I, I don't know what's up with, but anyways, aside from that, guys, I just read, I just read a trilogy of books. What? Jen. I'm so excited and proud of you, and I don't even know what you read. Paul read a book. Three books. Three books. Yes? Which books? I read the Miss Born trilogy by Brandon Sanderson. Huh. And it there you go. was really good. Have you read it, Jen? Yes. So I was put on to, I mean, obviously with Will of Time, that's one of the, it's like the only books I had been reading for years. Still not done. It, it'll a, take like years. 15. Yeah. Um, and he, Brandon Sanderson finished the Will of Time series after the original Robert right. Jordan died. But uh, my father-in-law loves Brandon Sanderson. And I saw him reading these books and he said, yeah, you can borrow them. So I read the first the first one, and it was the first one was okay, but I kind of, kind of, I kept reading because surprisingly, I just kept reading. Uh, I just it was right there. I had the books. I didn't have to go to the library or anything. Um, but uh, the way that he brought everything together, great twists, interesting uh, <laughs> magic systems, which I never thought I would ever say in my life. Um, <laughs> But uh, it it really ended on an interesting note, and he has some other books in book series that, one, go off the Mistborn trilogy into a later time period in the same planet. Yeah, no kidding. But there's, it's a whole universe, apparently. I'm, I'm learning this now. There's a whole universe called the Cosmere. Yeah. Cosmere. I don't know. Cosmere, it's a band. And, yeah. And... Uh, but apparently a whole universe, it's all connected somehow. And I guess I have like books to read now. Well, right on. Yeah, my wife's a big, big Brandon Sanderson fan as well. It partially probably came from Wheel of Time, although I I think she was she had read some of his other books as well. She may, she'll kick me for saying this too. I'm pretty sure she recommended to me, and I was probably listening to on tape some Brandon Sanderson as well, but I don't even remember what it was called at this point because I, I, like reserved most of my like listening. Well, first of all, most of my listening time has to be devoted to like actual work yep. and creating videos and things, things like that. It's very hard for me to like, other than having something on in the background, that's like kind of nothing that I don't have to pay attention to or care about. Usually, you know, HGTV types of things, you know, random YouTube stuff, whatever. Like I can't focus on a novel that I've never heard right. of before and, and actually get a lot out of that. Um, but I, I just, I don't have drive time anymore. Now right. that's going to change. I think the next time that we do a podcast recording, I'll be coming here to the studio from my new house, which is very far away <laughs> from this place. So I will suddenly have like an hour and a half that I that I will have to, yeah. to just be in the car and drive a long, long way to get here and a long, long way back. But um, so I imagine that at that point I'll probably start revisiting some some audio, audio books. books and things like that. But I haven't I haven't done it very much. So yeah, if she if she if the book that I'm supposed to be listening to and finishing is is a Brandon Sanderson one, then then uh, yeah, I guess I should get back to that. Yeah, I don't totally remember now. And if if you're a fan of Brandon Sanderson, I got good news for you because that man is a machine when it comes to it. writing. He is so astonishingly prolific. I don't know how he does it. I don't think I want to know what kind of witchcraft is involved, but he 
puts out content. So not just short you're, books you're not going to run out anytime soon. Like thick. No, I'm curious about books. this because so we recently did an episode of Out of Frame on the on Pulp Fiction novels, and um, one of the things I learned from Cinerama, which is the book that we kind of based a lot of that episode around, is that. And I, I was talking to one of our one of our other coworkers about this. I was talking to Kamau about this the other day, actually, but like. The one of the things that those authors did, because they were getting paid by the book, basically, or really by the page in a lot of cases. Um, so they they had a lot of incentive to write very, very quickly and turn around publishing times. Like in some cases, some of those guys were doing like a book a month, Whew. pretty much. That's crazy. Yeah. So the way that they did that, though, was by essentially creating Mad Libs passages. So they do like whole action scenes or mystery scenes or love scenes or whatever. And they do all that. It would just leave blanks in for like people's names and, you know, settings and whatever. And so they just copy and paste like entire pages of scenes. And then they just rearrange a little bit or they would, you know, add the right names, locations, change some adjectives, whatever. But the whole core of the scene would be basically the same. So you could get through, you know, a chapter of a book, you know, if you had a particular chapter that had to do with, you know, whatever you had pre-written or whatever, you could just just drop that in and just get it done. And it's funny because I, I, I read that and I was like, man, that is, you know, at the, on the one hand, you think, oh, that's very, that's cheap. That's not very creative or whatever. It, you know, it's going to lead to the very same, you know, same production. But then, and I'd read that book a long time ago. And then I, th- I think this happened probably after this, I went to an exhibit at the um, Richmond Museum of Art, Richmond, Virginia, of Rodin sculptures, August Rodin, um, who did, you know, The Kiss and The Thinker, and he's a French, enlightened, he's a French uh, romantic era sculptor, just wonderful, wonderful sculptor, and one of my all-time favorites, one of many people's all-time favorites, really. And what I learned, yep, yeah, <laughs> what I learned was that Rodin actually did the same thing, he had um, hands and arms and legs and torsos and stuff that he had sculpted very carefully, which then he made molds of and casts of. And then he would give, and then they do all these casts, basically. And then he would do other pieces or his assi- he would have his assistants do some of these things sometimes where they would put together another sculpture using configured parts from some of the other molds that he'd already made, basically. So they'd cast a bronze sculpture, but he'd like he'd made 10 different arms or whatever in different different positions. So he, he didn't actually have to... So he, he was very prolific in the same way. And that was, that was how he was able to do that. And then if you've ever seen one of his most famous pieces, it's called The Gates of Hell, which is incredible. It is... Um, you know, as the name implies, it is as if you, there's demons and angels and and human characters, and there's just hundreds. Of, it just feel I don't know if there's hundreds, but there's a lot. There's lots and lots of these figures, and the the sculpture is huge. I mean, the sculpture is like ten feet tall or whatever, and and um, and so you go like, oh my gosh, it would take him a million years to hand sculpt every single one of these, but that's how he did it. He had he had precast in different sizes, different scales, all kinds of things. So I don't know. It's it's kind of interesting to me because it, it seems like it's like less creative to do that in a certain way. But if you've already, they're still the one who did the creative work, yeah. first of all. And secondly, um, it, it's just sort of time saving more than anything else, you know. And of course, they'd make adjustments where they need to make adjustments. But if you could do that and and get a hundred little figures around the edges of a doorway. I mean, otherwise you take a hundred years to do that, you know, if you're doing it all by scr- uh, like all totally from scratch or whatever. So I don't know. It's kind of, kind of interesting. I don't know if Brandon Sanderson does that with books, but um, that is uh that's one way to do it. And I guess, mm-hmm. I don't know. I kind of want to tell that story just because I feel like there, there are people out there who think that, you know, who like work forever and ever and ever on one thing and don't think that they can, speed up the process or don't have any way of it's always ways to speed up the process it's always ways yep but let us uh let's get into the movie this week so i want to i want to talk about love and monsters 
Um, this is a this is a movie that sort of came out of nowhere for me. Like yeah. it was just something that was that just kind of showed up in my streaming queues and stuff. And I was just like, ah, oh, this I don't know. It seems it seems quirky enough for me to be something that I kind of enjoy. It's kind of post apocalyptic. Um, you know, I talked about the story before, so I'll kind of be brief on this. But basically, the story is, uh, you know, in the very not too distant future. I mean, basically present, essentially. Yeah. Um, there's an asteroid headed for Earth, and humans decide to to bomb the asteroid or to send missiles up, and then they do that. They manage to save themselves from the asteroid, but end up raining down chemicals on the planet, which somehow turn all the cold-blooded animals, you know, frogs, fish, lizards, whatever, bugs, uh, into into monstrous versions of those kinds of creatures. So they're gigantic frogs and snails and ants, cockroaches, whatever. Um, so all the human characters, like 95% of the population has been decimated and they're mostly living underground. And, and we meet um, Joel, who lives in a bunker, like pretty much everybody else that's still alive and who has been living there for um, seven years? Seven years, I believe yes. it's seven years. And, you know, he's lonely and everybody else is sort of paired up already a little bit, but he's kind of the odd man out, just doesn't, doesn't have anybody to, to be with. He's not a particularly brave person. He, he freezes up whenever there's danger. And of course, there's danger quite a bit in this world. He doesn't go out on raids, so he pretty much never leaves the bunker, but he's been kind of manning the radio. And as he's manning the radio, he he discovers that his girlfriend from prior to the event is living only about 85 miles away in another bunker. And, and is alive. And is alive. And so he almost sort of rashly decides he is going to trek. He's going to go out into the onto the surface and he's going to trek 85 miles alone, alone to go find his girlfriend, his former girlfriend, Amy, and uh, and that basically that it's worth taking the risk to to get out there and and do this, if it means that he can reconnect with somebody who's who means something to him. So that's pretty much the premise of the story, and it's just it's a very very sweet movie, and there are lots of monsters and weird situations, and it's kind of bizarre in a lot of ways. But I just I don't know I kind of loved it, and I kind of wanted you guys to see it. So. I don't know, Jen. Why don't you uh, f- first thoughts on this movie? Because I know I kind of I kind of talked it up, but was I was I right? <laughs> you were right. It was a shockingly wholesome movie. Yeah. Uh, even though it's got like this weird dystopian setting, and you know the world is terrifying. The monsters are grotesque. Mm-hmm. Like they're awful. Like that, I that can't frog, that even, frog in particular. Was that just like, frog. <laughs> oh my goodness. And like, I honestly cannot even imagine anything scarier to me than like a 10 foot tall, vaguely sentient ant that oh, wants yeah. to eat me. Like yeah. that is super creepy. Ooh, that oh, like sort of bad. swamp centipede uh, guy. Like, oh, that one. Oh, that one no was good. no good. I don't like I don't like normal no sized good. centipedes. Not great. Not yeah. what I want. Yeah. Nope. Yeah. It's it's, it's super business. it's super sweet. I think part of it is because because it's so optimistic. Like Joel is just it's just so optimistic as as a character. You know he he really believes that he can. He has no reason to believe that he can do this. He's frozen every time an attack has happened. He's not been proven himself to be very good at survival type of things at all. I mean, it's kind of a miracle that he's still alive at all, to be honest. But, um, but man, he just he he believes he can get it done. You know, mm-hmm. Paul. What are and your? He's uh, so sweet. Oh, and he's very sweet. What are your first? Yeah. So I. I agree with Jen. I thought this movie was really good. And this is a great example of a, I'm not sure what the budget was, but it couldn't have been that much. But this is a great example yeah. of telling a relatively, I mean, it's a the relatively big earth changing story. Everyone, 95% of the population's dead. 
but distilling it down to one person yeah and making it very small and cheap yeah and but but doing that in a way that made it you know way more human right right it's not about the monster attack like in fact that the scenes I mean, there are a lot of monster scenes in the movie, which it really does live up to its premise in that. I yeah. mean, honestly, the name of the movie could not be more apt. I mean, it's literally just the entirety of the movie is <laughs> love and monsters. That's, that, that's literally it. But, you know, like even like the asteroid and all that kind of stuff, like it's very short. Yep. You know, a um, little bit of it happens in animation, which is clever anyway, because it turns out that Joel, one of Joel's actual skills, one of his only actual skills is actually Draw. as an yeah. artist. And the funny thing is they also kind of established that he learned how to be a good artist over that seven year period because we see him drawing prior to the attack and he's kind of joking around. He's not great at it. Not good at all. Well, he's not good, although I don't know how much of that is him joking around with with Amy. But in any case, he starts drawing monsters and just progressively gets better and better at it. And and so there's some of that setup is done in hand drawn Mm -hmm. you know, sort of ruled, ruled paper, you know, animation, which fits the character also. He's explaining what happened and he's kind of drawing you the story of what happened. And you can do that instead of doing a, you know, $30 million uh, asteroid, you know, CGI sequence. Right. You know, so yeah, you can save a ton of money doing that. And also it's cute and it works for the movie. Actually, it works better for the story that way. But uh, yeah, I don't know. It's um, I think another thing I really liked about the movie is is Michael Rooker, who shows up about midway through, and um, you know Joel gets himself into because again he's not very good at survival. No. So he falls into a hole because he's dumb. Also, he's really dumb in that situation because he's literally like drawing or writing while walking through a monster infested. What are you doing? He's like day one or two out in the wild here, so I'll forgive him a little bit, the fact that he is, but man, that's dumb. That's just, anyway, falls in a hole and gets pulled out by Michael Rooker, um, just narrowly escaping some other horrible monsters. And uh, and then Michael Rooker, you think, M Michael Rooker, if you don't know, is Yondu in Guardians of the Galaxy, or you might know him as Merle from Walking Dead, and, and I think especially with Walking Dead, you kind of think of Michael Rooker as being somebody who's going to come in and be a horrible person, and then turns out, nope, he's a, he's a good dad, basically. Trying to... Teach them the ropes. Teaching them the ropes. Yeah. I don't know. Jen, so the, the theme that I kind of wanted to talk about with this was kind of this idea of like living in perpetual fear... So that's kind of his his existence is like like living in in fear of everything in a bunker and and the whole movie to a large extent is is about venturing out you know in spite of your fear having the courage to venture out of the the perceived safety of of isolation you know and I to some extent I felt like that was kind of appropriate for the world that we live in right now. Um, but I don't know. I'd, I'd like to talk about that a little bit. I mean, what are your, I mean, obviously that's a pretty major theme in the, in the movie, but, um, you know, we've all been living in that kind of isolation for a while and, uh, hopefully maybe some people are starting to venture out. Is that how you feel? Yeah. Yeah, it is. And, um, you know, I have a slightly unique perspective on all of this, um, because I, you know, you two know, uh, I'm sure a lot of the listeners know by now, but I have Crohn's disease, which is an autoimmune disorder. And generally speaking, the way that you treat this is through immunosuppression. Because what happens is my immune system gets a little crossed up, gets a little uh, overzealous and starts attacking the healthy cells of my body, thinking that it is an invading force, right? So to stop it from doing that, you just kind of beat it into submission and suppress the whole thing, generally speaking. And so I have, I have always been at a much higher risk for wild and wacky diseases and infections, uh, some of which I have gotten, and it's not fun. And 
the that feeling that so many people have had during this last year and some change that they're taking their life in their own hands whenever they venture out of their little safe spaces, whether that be their houses or, you know, even smaller areas than that. But, you know, that's, that's my whole life is, is a calculated risk. You know, how willing am I to, you know, catch my death today? And, you know, when you get handed a, a sentence like that, when you're 18 years old, it's, it's very shocking. And because when you're 18, you, you still know, like, you don't just believe, but you know, like deep down in your bones that, that you're immortal and nothing bad is ever going to happen <laughs> to you. Um, and then suddenly that notion is, is swept away from you and you have to decide how you're going to, how you're going to live with that. And so at this point in my life, I have been living with that diagnosis for fully half of my life now. And I, I've been very scared and I've been distressingly cavalier, just wildly opposite ends of the spectrum on that. But the thing of it is, you, you're always taking your life in your hands whenever you go outside. Um, whenever you get up out of bed, honestly, yeah. uh, life is risk and life is danger. And only you can decide how much you're willing to tolerate. But from someone who knows, choosing in fear and to stay where you believe that you are safe uh, and not take any risks is no kind of life. And I think, I think it's, that's what like Joel in, in the film, what, what I, and I, I'm glad you, you told that story anyway, but like, uh, cause you know, I mean, you and I have talked about it a bunch of times, but like what I love about part of what I love about the film is that Joel sort of realizes that at some point he realizes that, you know, he's been in seven years, he's been living in a bunker, not living at all. You know, he's been afraid of everything. He's been, you know, basically feeling useless. I mean, it's actually like after seven years, the one, I mean, if you can, if you can accept the conceit of the movie that there are monsters and everything like running around the earth and it's post-apocalyptic, but like beyond that, probably the most unbelievable thing in the movie to me at some point is that Joel is not actually depressed because he's actually still very upbeat and very optimistic. And that's probably, I mean, you can sort of chalk that up to some people have that temperament a little bit more than others, but I mean, but he is he has felt useless for seven years, you know, and he's felt trapped and, and mostly trapped by his own fear because he's not even one who will go out on like hunting raids or, or to go find food or anything like this. So he doesn't even leave for that. And in fact, his, his bunkmates don't, don't want him to because he'd be a liability most of the time if, if he went out. By the way, that's another thing about the movie that I really enjoyed is that none of his bunkmates, n nobody, no human character in that movie is a bad person. Well, other no. than, uh, other than, at the very, very end or yep. the the sort of the tail end of the movie, there's one basically one bad group of of people um, that we interact with. But all of his, all the people who live in the bunker with him, actually just they love him. They treat him as family. They think he is family. You know, they all feel that way about each other. So he even kind of has this moment where he's leaving because he doesn't feel like he's gotten the human connection he wants because everybody's kind of paired up. Um, and he wants to go reconnect with Amy. But even on his journey of trying to reconnect with Amy and learn more about himself and learn to become less less afraid, he also realizes that his bunker family was actually loved him and was his family as well. And 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 so I love that about the movie too. Like he didn't just leave them as if they were like they didn't care about him or they were weren't good people like they were also good people you know all the people that amy had lived in a bunker with they were all good people too you know kind of teasing him a little bit when he got there right. but but you know they're all good and michael rooker and and the girl that he's with uh, minnow 
uh, also real good. You know, like there's just not a lot of stuff in that movie where you go like, yeah, it's all very scary. Like the world is scary and the things that can happen to you are really scary. Um, but is it the question becomes, is that human connection worth taking those risks and, 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 you know, working through your fear, right? And working up the courage to work past that fear so that you can actually live and be connected with other people. And I don't know, just feel, I feel like this has been the world we've lived in for over a year yeah. at this point. And I think a lot of people, um, did not, did not make the choice that Joel makes. And I think that that's been kind of disheartening to me. And it, it's partly, I would say it's been disheartening to me, especially because I've seen you handle the same situation prior to all of this. <laughs> right. And then after the fact, and like the way that you've handled it has been way more courageous than <laughs> half the people that I've, that I've encountered over the past year. So it's, I mean, it's like Jen, I mean, Jen asked me for, um, basically Jen kind of isolated herself at the very beginning of all of this, kind of not being sure what, you know, what everything was going to be. Mm -hmm. But, you know, fairly soon after that, I feel like a few months after that, I mean, Jen had started to kind of wrap her mind around what the risks were and everything else and started making those kinds of decisions. But not one time was she ever, and I've never seen you do this, she ever like everybody else in the world needs to, bend to my risk preferences she's right. always said this is my this is my issue and i will deal with it the way that makes the most sense for me but she's never demanded of other, other people like ah just, anyway jen i just love that about you it's one of my favorite things and yeah this this movie is like kind of a little bit of an embodiment of that like yep. like not you know not living in that kind of fear because it's not awesome and it's it's just not it's not a life you know yeah, it's it's this is the perfect movie for the 2021. Yeah. And I mean this movie came out last year, but yeah, it's a 2021 It's a 2020 cuz it is yeah. like, like his this 7 years for for Joel and human society the movie you could that's 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 2020. Yeah. Bunker bunker life. Right. Now when hit it's it's time for, you know, the hero's journey trans, getting yourself Back to living life. Back yeah. to what what makes being on this planet worth it, and <clears throat> being having that courageous attitude. Yeah. Of of really finding love and connection, and and facing the danger that is out there. And it's so weird to me. Like so many people's response has been to demand that everyone else live in the same level of fear that they're in. Right. Which has just been a weird, it, it's been one of the, maybe the more disheartening things for me. And, and one of the things that sort of changed, I, I'm historically a very, very optimistic person, per, particularly in terms of my sense of human nature and humanity in general. You know, of course, I, I think that humans respond to incentives. They also respond quite a bit to the environment that they're in. And when you live in an environment where where you turn on the news or any aspect of media and all it does for a year straight is tell you about all of the terrifying, terrifying things to be afraid of and how everybody is, you know, everybody is awful and, you know, needs to be kept inside for everybody's safety. I mean, of course, there's going to be a large percent of the po population who does end up just falling into that trap, just living in, in horrible, horrible fear. But it's been kind of shocking to me the, the number of people who've really seemed to kind of revel in that fear as if there's something heroic about being in the bunker rather than something heroic about stepping outside of the bunker. Like, that's very strange to me. Yeah. And it's never really made a lot of sense. This is a phenomenon that I've noticed is that the people – and this is not obviously a hundred percent of the time, but it, a lot of times, especially on social media, you see people that are very adamant about stay home. Where am I? They, yeah, yeah. Don't, they have, don't take any risks at all. Economic situation where they can stay home. Yeah. They yeah. don't have to if worry about that. They don't have to go. And this was like the celebrity joke at the beginning of all right. Of this, right? Like it's, it's all these celebrities seeing imagine while they're, they're, you know, living in these mansions and stuff. And, you're just like, 
Well, yeah, okay. <laughs> you know, you have, uh, you have like 10 acres and a swimming pool and, you know, 7,000 square foot house. And right. Th- th- just, okay. I mean, and by the way, you don't even want to live in there for permanently. Like, you, you don't even want to be stuck there forever. And then you're thinking like, yeah, I mean, I don't know. There's a lot of people out there that live in a 600 square foot apartment. And that's not really the same experience that you have at that point. So... I don't know. I mean, that's, yeah, it, there's a lot of people. And you're right. I think a lot of them are people who did not face the same challenges. They, they aren't the, the people who had to worry that much about where their next paycheck was coming from mm-hmm. or where, uh, you know, whether or not they would experience food shortages or. I, I, it's you know. honestly surprising there hasn't been more class populism yeah. rhetoric come out of this. Yeah. I and mean, I don't know if it's coming, but. Maybe, but all, well, I think it's weird because I think some of that kind of went the opposite direction I would have expected to some extent where it's, I think some of the, I don't know, people, I feel like people directed their anger in certain areas. Mm -hmm. And I think some of that anger, to be fair, I really genuinely believe this. I think some of that anger was just directed towards, and rightly so in certain ways, but it's, it's like some of the police, uh, anti uh, police protests and things like that. Um, you know, I, I find it hard to believe just because I've, I've seen this for years and years and years, find it hard to believe that a lot of the, like the national aspect of the protests that we got, especially last summer necessarily had that much to do with the specific events. So say George Floyd, for example, and maybe a little bit more to do with people being unemployed and cooped up for a long time. And so... Not, not to say that it's a not a worthy issue in certain cases, but I think when you look at the level of turnout, you know, I think yeah. some of that is civil unrest that's been pent up because of these other these other things. And I talk, I've talked about that on Red Up Frame before too. But um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, th- I think it took a moral issue to overcome the sense of moral superiority of living in the bunker for people to like get out and kind of do that. Yeah. But, um, you know, another thing we haven't talked about in the movie, which is I'm probably bearing the lead in some ways is the dog because, oh my goodness, that the dog is very cute. I'm going to have, I'm going to be a little contrarian, I believe. Yeah. You don't like the dog? No. The dog's great. There's no way this dog survives for seven years. Also, well, I don't know if the dog was there for seven years. Though. Where, then where was it? I don't like this is what I'm not. Well, I think this he was dog was living, obviously in, not living in that uh, living in that van with the his his yeah. girl. The dog, the dog I had a, a a person. Yeah, for a, a while. Clearly. We don't we don't and know how. Ta- yeah, we don't know how long that person has been missing. But I don't think it's the entire seven years. The dog doesn't look seven years old. For well, all right, but that's uh, okay. So I, I don't know. I train <laughs> dogs. I, it's like Airbud. It felt like Airbud. <sighs> this is my only nitpick with the movie. You know, I, 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 there had to be look, one. Everybody else one. who watches this movie, you're, you're gonna love this dog. Oh, I, this I, is the best dog. I don't, this is the best dog. I, 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 the dog is. There's no. The, the dog did nothing wrong. He's the best dog. He's a good boy. Yeah. And honestly, when I the first saw there's a dog. Boy. He was the goodest. Good. I thought they were going to kill him off and I would just throw something at the TV. No, they didn't. I thought he was going to leave with Michael Rooker. <laughs> <laughs> that would have been. <laughs> there is a scene when basically when, when Joel, uh, Joel falls in the hole, as I said earlier, and then he gets picked up by Michael Rooker and then he, he walks with them for a ways. They're headed in generally the same direction, at least for a while. They're planning to head in the same direction. So they're walking together. He's learning things from, you know, master survivalist, um, in Michael Rooker's character. And then, and then they eventually have to part ways. And by the time they part ways, I'm like, man, that dog is just going to go with them instead. Because Joel is clearly making the, I mean, this is sort of the way that the movie is kind of framing this choice is that Joel's kind of making the wrong choice at this point. Like he's, he's at a crossroads where he could continue the last what, 30 miles or something of his journey to Amy, or he could continue with his new friends with Michael Rooker and, and the, sorry, forgetting her name. Um, Ariana Greenblatt is the actress who plays Minnow, but Clyde and Minnow. 
And um, he could continue with them and go, you know, north to this this mountainous area that supposedly is a little bit monster free. Because the monsters, you recall, are cold blooded so that they're not there are fewer of them surviving in the colder, colder climates, I guess. But um, I don't know. It's interesting because I also think that in the end, I think that he actually made the right choice. Joel did by continuing on his mission, A, because he completed his mission, regardless of whether or not what he found at the end of it was exactly what he expected, which it wasn't quite what he expected, but also because I think having that personal journey of getting a little bit of help to learn more about how to be better and then having a good moment to test yourself at the end of that and actually know that you don't need someone else to to be there to save you in the perilous moments that that you have ahead. I think that's I think that was really important for his character. Yeah. I and mean, this, this is one of those stories that uh it's just the typical hero's it journey. Really, yes, it really there, is. There yeah. really isn't anything that's just But in a in a softened way in some sense yeah. because because like typically in the hero's journey like you you talk about Joseph Campbell and all that kind of stuff like the wise old mentor, who's sort of the the Michael Rooker character, would die, right? At the very least, he would be removed from the story in a, in a really aggressive way, yeah. right? That would be emotionally crippling, potentially. Like Obi-Wan Kenobi dying in, in uh, Star Wars, whatever, right? So, but he doesn't. They just amicably part ways, you know? I, I kind of got the sense that Amy rejecting him was supposed to be the emotionally crippling thing. Yeah, it would be a little bit more. And um which it was, but he overcame it. Yeah. And snapped out of a stupor to save the colony. But, yeah, but I also and I also feel like that was pretty important too from from just a narrative perspective because after 7 years you're not the same person. No. You know, and whatever you imagine in your head that it's going to be like to be with this person you were with in high school or whatever, it's just it's not the same. You know, Amy was sending mixed signals, though. Well, she was over the radio and it, and in real life. Well, <laughs> yeah, but I mean, look, it, in the end, it, it actually did kind of come back around. It kind of worked itself out. But she is still a different person. Yeah. You know, and it, and she didn't give him the reaction that, that he which sort fine. of expected. Yeah. Which I also liked because yeah. I think but, and also for me, it was a little bit more real in, in certain ways because she wasn't like a horrible person. No. She was still the same person he had he had loved before. She's just and she wasn't mean about it either. She wasn't. No, she was very she kind her, about it. Yeah, she did her very best to let mm-hmm. him down easy. But you know she's. But then made out with him. Well, again, he saved the colony at that point. I mean, so yeah, they're okay. they're gonna get back to. I mean, if they're if they're doing a. If they ever did a sequel to this movie, which they shouldn't, Lo- by the way. Love and Monsters too. I do not recommend doing a sequel to this movie. I don't think it would make any sense. I think that the movie sets itself up to have made a sequel because, you know, you can have the adventures of Amy and Joel. You could have them, their next mission be to go find Michael Rooker in, in the mountains and whatever. But it's, it's just a movie that should just be. Just let it be. It is what it is. Um, let it end there. You know, but it ends with him going. Uh, sorry, I'm going to spoil the end of the movie here. But we've kind of gone, gone through this whole thing at this point. But like, um, you know, like it, I, it's, I love this, too, because it ends with him going back to his own colony to save his colony. to save his colony, because they're actually his family as well. Like they're they're just as important. And he kind of lost that. That's part of what he had lost with all of this, which was kind of interesting. Like he'd. He'd gotten so fixated on the idea that he had this relationship that he had to go recreate that he kind of didn't even see what was in front of him either, you know. But I get it. He was alone. I mean, he would, you know, in the in the context of the of the bunker. Yeah, he had. I don't know. I mean, that would be hard, right? Yeah. I mean, I, I think we can agree that it would be very difficult to be around a whole bunch of other couples and to be the no only, personal space to be, and there's no personal space anywhere. And to be the only one who's not paired up in that way, it's, it's tough. Yeah. You know, it's not a pleasant experience. So, yeah, I don't know. Uh, anyway, I that's, I, I suppose we can kind of end that discussion here, but I just, I, I guess I'll get final thoughts on the movie for everybody. But for me, it's just, it was such a sweet movie and it was such a non-cynical movie and it came 
kind of out of nowhere and, yeah. and the themes of kind of breaking out of your bunker and and experiencing the world in spite of your fear just felt like such a great theme that more people should should check out right now. So I highly recommend this movie. Jen, what do you thought? It was such a delightful movie. Uh, I, I wasn't super sure what to expect. Sean had really hyped this movie up. And generally speaking, that's, you know, that's a good gauge for me. But at the same time, it seemed like such an absurd premise. Like, I, <laughs> I really didn't know what I was going to get from this movie. But it's it's such a delight. And it is such a joyful movie, which is weird to say in like this post-apocalyptic dystopian monster ridden society, but it is very joyful. And it's, it, it does really paint a picture and really encourages people to get out there and experience life despite, not only in, in spite of your fear, but also in spite of like the very real dangers that are out there, you know, yeah. sometimes fear is warranted and that's fine, but we can't let it paralyze us from living our lives and experiencing life as it's meant to be experienced by humans. Well, no, I, I love this movie. It's surprised me. Mm -hmm. I didn't think I'd like it as much as I did. Uh, in a different time, this would be a cable classic where you'd see it on TNT, TBS, and you would see it for 20 years from now. Yeah. I don't know what, where that kind of stuff lives, but no idea. This is, this is that, this is the perfect Saturday I, yeah. afternoon, hop in 20 minutes in, you know exactly what's going on, hop out. Yeah. It's actually pretty quotable. Yeah. Also um, is. It's, it's one of those movies that you can rewatch over and over and again. And, uh. You know, it's just getting people to see it the first time. Yeah, we didn't even talk about this. And I, I hate to throw this like last minute thing in here. But one of the other things I really loved about this movie is an, another kind of theme is is that the monsters themselves aren't even monsters. They're just animals. Well, some. No. It's, well, okay. But what I mean is like the, there's a kind of a lesson that he gets taught at one point where you can kind of you got to kind of gauge based on their eyes whether or not they're trying to attack you or if they're they're just trying to exist you know and look they're scary regardless because some of their animals they're going to eat you if you i mean they're looking for food like anything else but um the kind of the the final climax of the movie um i'm gonna i'm not even i don't even want to spoil it honestly i'm gonna because we've we've kind of talked our way around a lot of this stuff but haven't really spoiled anything very important to this movie um, as far as the actual plot or anything goes. But the final monster that he fights, you think is going to be the most horrifying thing in the world. And, and the question then becomes like, yeah, is it really even a monster? You know, like maybe it's just an animal looking to exist, you know? And so I like that too. I, I, there's things, there's aspects of this. So, God, sorry, I'm totally already, I'm going on a tangent the very, very last, last thing here. But, um, Fee, um, a couple years ago, Fee put together some art uh, to express our six core sort of values that we have written out on. And we, and we, I worked with our graphic designer, senior graphic designer, Tim, to put together an actual piece of art that, that lives in our office, basically. And it's, it's big, and I had it printed on metal, so it's... Um, it's a really cool process where it's very like shimmering and it reacts to light in a really cool way and, and stuff. And um, one of the things is t as, as I was kind of writing out the story uh, of the art, because we get six separate scenes. But one of the things that was really important is, is that there's, there's a little monster and I'll, I guess we'll um, maybe we'll put this uh, Pavel. I'll, I'll probably have, have us put this up on the show because I actually think it's it's interesting to actually look at this is that there's a little monster that sort of you see this sort of hero's journey story play out there where it's like this, this campsite of kind of people with a little monster hiding in the trees and then they're 
they're talking to each other and kind of worried that the monster is going to attack them or whatever. So they organ. I mean, this is basically the story is that they then organize sort of a hunting party and kind of chase this monster. Every single one of these frames, and there's six of them throughout this thing, has this monster somewhere in the background. And then at the end, and this was, um, I, this is one thing, Tim did an amazing job on the design and on the art and everything, but one of the things that was kind of, I don't wanna say it was like a totally a last minute change to the values art, but it was not in the original conception. And so it was something that I, I changed way into the, pro maybe into the middle of the process, was that the end of it was that the humans end up offering the monster some food and becoming friends with the monster instead of uh, instead of attacking or killing it. It's, it's not it's not a dragon slaying sort of thing because I didn't think that that was going to represent fees values in the way that I wanted it to, you know, and. Um, I just, it made me think of that with the end of this movie a little bit, which is just like sometimes the right move to stop the monster is, is not to attack. It's not to be violent. You know, it's not to be uh, aggressive in that way. So I kind of, it's just, again, it's kind of keeping with like the sweetness of everything in this. But um, I think we'll show this values art because I'm, I'm really proud of it. And it's one of my favorite things that we've ever done. But um, anyway, yeah. Go watch this movie. Yeah, definitely. It's good. 100%. All right. I'm going to end that there. Uh, for those who are subscribers of the show on Patreon and Subscribestar, stick around. We're going to answer a few more of your questions. I've got a handful prepped and ready to go right here. But for everybody else, thank you so much for watching, for you know listening to us on whatever podcast platform you're listening on. Um, and also, you know, make sure you check us out on YouTube for Out of Frame or um, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, all of the things. We are everywhere, and we hope you will also join us on Discord. Um, and by the way, we're, if you want to ask us questions on Discord, um, we'll potentially get to your questions there as well. But, you know, you have to, you have to actually subscribe to hear the answers. There so, you go. So uh, join us on Discord. And then uh, consider consider supporting the show on Patreon. Subscribestar.com slash Out of Frame Show. But for everybody else, thank you so much. And we will see you next time.